Hey guys, welcome back to another classic review. My name is Midnight Strike 3625 and the topic of choice today is of course going to be the thrash metal band Metallica. Now, I've actually reviewed one of their albums in the past, Master of Puppets, but aside from that, haven't really shed much light on them. And the reason being is because I believe Metallica is one of those bands that's pretty much been done to death in terms of reviewing in discographies. And essentially every review you'll find will pretty much say the same thing. So, needless to say, I've been kind of trying to, you know, shy away from that. But <clears throat> when it comes down to it, I do want to get my opinions out there on a few of their albums. Not all, but a few. One of those albums, of course, being the successor of Master of Puppets and Justice for All, which I will be reviewing for you guys today. So, getting into it, Metallica, during the production of this album, were in a very, very hard spot, especially dealing with the tragic bus accident that claimed the life of Cliff Burton, with which they chose to deal with it in a rather unhealthy way. Alcohol. They actually gained the nickname Alcoholica during this time period because of their antics on and off stage. So, you know, aside from that, they needed to find someone to fill the enormously huge shoes that Cliff Burton had left. So, their search actually ended with Jason Newstead of Flotsam and Jetsam fame, so when they accepted him in, they didn't exactly accept him in with open arms. They, in fact, hazed the shit out of him by toning down the bass on this entire album, as well as forcing him to eat wasabi without telling him what it was. So, you know, another weird story about that later so watch metallica documentary behind the music awesome anyways jason newstead wasn't exactly accepted with open arms but you'll see that on this album they tone the bass down which you know you could say that it was because jason newstead played with a pick and he needed a foam wall even on the production of the black album but most more than likely it's because of the hazing that was going on during this time period so other than the bass being toned down, the production does come off a little thin, especially with the rhythm section of the guitars and everything. It's just not as booming and loud and, you know, productive. Not productive. It's just not as booming and as loud and as kind of in your face as Master of Puppets was. But they could be using a different setup. I could be wrong. But when it comes down to the song structures themselves, they are perfectly structured around complex riffs and solos. And just everything sounds spot on. You know, the, even they say nowadays that the songs are just too damn long and that, you know, they could be shorter and, you know, they barely ever play anything live from this album. Aside from, you know, Blackened and One and the occasional few riffs from the Freight Ends of Sanity just to cock tease everyone at the concert. So the longest they've actually played that song, Freight Ends of Sanity, was at the Live in Seattle 1989 where they also played And Justice For All in its entirety. One of the only concerts that they ever did so. So, needless to say, this album has the longest songs in the history of Metallica, with the exception of Death Magnetic in 2008, with the Suicide and Redemption. So, you know, getting into the album itself, though, Newstead, like I said in my Newstead review of Heavy Metal Music, he has a very unique setup. He has a very unique style of playing bass, but it's really overshadowed by the rhythm guitars in this particular album. So getting into the album itself, though, it kicks off with Blackened, which just keeps getting louder and louder as it plays the backwards slash reverse riff that James Hetfield is playing on rhythm. So it sounds phenomenal, especially getting into the entire song and the rest of the song. Lots of soloing going on. And James's vocals, especially on this song, as well as the rest of the album, are just way more raw, way more aggressive, and gritty when compared to albums such as Master of Puppets. Now, I actually can't decide on whether or not I like the gritty, aggressive, raw-style vocals on Injustice for All, or just the in-your-face screams that are on Master of Puppets. Master of Puppets is certainly produced better, but... The raw and gritty and intense vocals that are found on And Justice For All just inc increase the intensity that is found on the rest of the songs. So it's kind of a win-win in that situation. Now getting into the rest of the album though, the next song is of course the title track, And Justice For All, that begins with a really awesome clean riff, and I can even play it on my guitar. It was one of the first things that I could play on my guitar besides one of course, but that's a different story. It's the longest, or one of the longest songs on the album, clocking in at 9 minutes and 47 seconds. There's a lot of intricate solos. The entire song is just very complex and perfectly built up 
to just an explosion of different riffs, and it's really awesome. More mid-tempo, it's not the fastest song on the album, but it's also not the slowest, so I really like this song. One of my favorite songs on the album, aside from, of course, Harvester of Sorrow, which I'll get into a little bit later. The next song, Eye of the Beholder, really like the chorus in this one. It's really structured very nicely, well-crafted, and the vocals just definitely give it that raw edge, especially in the chorus, which it can really be heard. So... The next song, of course, begins with the familiar gunshots, and that, of course, is one, like I said, the most known song off of this entire album, and I believe it's, well, no, it's not the shortest. I thought it was the shortest, but it's not. Anyways, one is one of those really, really just clean, ballady kind of songs. Metallica have this tradition where the fourth track on every one of their albums is going to be the ballad, dating all the way back to Ride the Lightning. So, the fourth track most commercial, ballad -y, but it gets really raw and aggressive, especially about halfway to three quarters of the way through the song, where the drums just start thundering, and it just gets really, really built up to this explosion, so it just sounds really awesome. Um, the next one is The Shortest Straw, one of my least favorite songs on this album. It's kind of filler-ish, but it is a very good song, just not one of their more well-known ones, and... It's a little long, even clocking in at 6 minutes and 37 seconds. It just seems way too long. I don't know why. I don't know what it is. I do like the vocals, of course, and it is a little bit more intense than some of the songs, but, you know, overall, not the best song. The next one is Harvester of Sorrow, and let me tell you, this is the most atmospheric, intense song on the entire album, building up to get even faster and faster, even though it's more mid-tempo, it begins really slowly with a really crunchy, just heavy riff. And, you know, it's just got that really atmospheric, really kind of setting the mood kind of tone in the beginning before it builds up to this raw edge. I don't really know how to describe it, but I do like it. I do like the just how catchy it is and the structure of it overall. So my favorite song on the album has to be Harvester of Sorrow. I just really like it. Next one, of course, is the Cock Tease, that is the Frayed Ends of Sanity. And I say that because they've never played this song in its entirety live, at least that I know about. They actually Cock Tease this song, or at least parts of it, at every single concert almost. And it just, you know, it aggravates fans. They never <laughs> hear the entire thing. Actually, they played most of it at Live in Seattle 89, but they got bored of that one. You'll have to check out the DVD to see what I mean on that one. Awesome concert, by the way. Probably their best, in my opinion. But anyways, they actually play about <clears throat> three minutes of this one when it comes down to it. I don't even know if they know the whole thing of this one. It's it's kind of hard to, hard to say, but it is very aggressive and well-crafted. Like I said, structurally, it's one of the best and you know, it's on my top tier for this album. Um, to Live Is To Die, the longest song on the album. Most people kind of debate on whether or not it can be considered an instrumental because it does have those spoken words by James. I would say, yeah, it's an instrumental. Sometimes instrumentals use sound bits from various things where they're talking, but it's not necessarily singing. I mean, they do it doesn't have a complete riff structure centered around vocals. So it was made in the memory of Cliff Burton, and has a lot of different bass tracks from Cliff Burton in it. I think Jason redid them, but they were initially written by Cliff Burton. Really good song, phenomenal writing, phenomenal, you know, instrumental. Really love it. The next one, of course, is the last one, Dyer's Eve. Sounds very reminiscent of such songs like Damage Incorporated and Battery off of Metallica's Master of Puppets. And it's just a really fast-paced, really aggressive song. It's the fastest song on the album, and James' vocals sound gruff and intense and aggressive as ever. He sounds angry, he sounds violent, sounds like he's about to beat the shit out of someone, and I just, I love it. It's a perfect closer for an amazing album. Overall, I'm going to rate this album probably a 9.8 out of 10, citing reasons for the 9.8, probably just because... The production's not as solid as Master of Puppets, otherwise it would be a perfect 10 in my eyes. If they remastered it and put some more bass in there and just amped up the rhythm section a bit, made it a little louder, you know, it would probably be a perfect 10 in my eyes. But this, nevertheless, it is a masterpiece and I do love this album. One of my favorites, probably my second favorite, next to, you know, Master of Puppets and then Ride the Lightning. But then again, I digress. So with that, 9.8 out of 10, thank you very much for watching. This is Midnight Strike 3625. Keep calm and rock on, guys.